Here are the five platonic solids. The tetrahedron, which has four faces. The cube, more correctly called the hexahedron, because it has six faces. The octahedron, having eight faces. The dodecahedron, which has 12 pentagons as faces. And finally, the icosahedron, which has 20 faces, all consisting of equilateral triangles. Now, these platonic solids, and that, that name comes from the uh, Greek philosopher Plato, are more correctly called regular polyhedra. Now, a polyhedron consists of several parts. Here we'll look at an octahedron. And it has the following parts. It has the face, or the hedron, which is there. It has an edge, which is there. And it has a vertex, which is there. So what is a regular polyhedron? Well, a regular polyhedron is a closed, in other words, there's no openings, solid figure, meaning it's in three dimensions, whose faces are regular polygons. Well, that begs the question, what is a regular polygon? It is, again, a closed planar figure. Now, planar meaning it's on a flat plane or two-dimensional with three or more sides of equal length and interior angles of equal measure. So what are the candidates we'll use for regular polygons to create our regular polyhedra? There's the equilateral triangle, which has an interior angle of 60 degrees. There's the square, or regular quadrilateral, to be more precise, which has an interior angle of 90 degrees. The regular pentagon, which has an interior angle of 108 degrees. And finally, the regular hexagon, which has an interior angle of 120 degrees. So now let's look at each one of the regular polyhedra and see what they look like. The tetrahedron, which is sometimes called a triangular pyramid, looks like this. And if it were hollow and made out of paper and we unfolded the paper, it might look something like this. So this pattern, if we were to cut it out uh, on paper, fold it up and glue it or tape it together, you would get the tetrahedron. And we'll look at each one of these regular polyhedra uh, by looking at their patterns. The cube or hexahedron, the pattern looks like this. And you've probably seen something like this if you ever created a cardboard box. The center of the cross would be the bottom of the box, and the leftmost square would be the top of the box. You fold up the sides, tape them together, and put the top, fold the top on top of the uh, on top of the box. The octahedron looks like this, and if you imagine the uh, leftmost four equilateral triangles you could see that if you folded them together, you would get a square pyramid. Likewise, with the rightmost five, uh, four equilateral triangles, and you would basically fold those two square pyramids together to get the octahedron. Now, the dodecahedron is a little more complicated. The pattern for it looks like this. So you would have to carefully fold each one of those uh, pentagons together and then glue them together and of course doing this by hand would be uh, would be a little bit tricky but that's what the pattern for the dodecahedron looks like finally the icosahedron's pattern is the most complicated of all it consists of 20 equilateral triangles that look like this so you would have to very carefully fold them and put them get together 
So the big question of this presentation is why are there only five of these things, not more? Well, it largely has to do with the gaps of those patterns and folding them together. One thing we have to say about creating these polyhedron models is that each vertex must consist of at least three coincident vertices of a regular polygon. If there were only two polygons at a vertex, folding them together would, would not necessarily make a, a, a three-dimensional object. In fact, you could fold them together and make a flat plane. So let's take a look at, at some examples of where three polygons come together at a polyhedron vertex. The first one is part of the tetrahedron. And you see we have three equilateral triangles come to, coming together at a point where it's circled by that red circle. Here's a section of the square of the cube where three squares are coming together at a point. And here is a piece of the of the dodecahedron coming together, um, three three pentagons coming together at a point. So let's let's look at each of each one of these in turn. For the tetrahedron, we have three equilateral triangles coming together, each being 60 degrees. If we add all of those up together, we get 180 degrees. Now take away the 180 from 360 and that leaves us with 180. In other words, a gap is formed of 180 degrees shown there. And so if we folded these two, these two uh, edges together, we would get that part of the tetrahedron. So what about the square? Uh, but what about the cube? So with a cube, we have 390 degree angles. Those add up to 270 degrees, leaving us with 90 degrees and that angle is shown right there. Folding these edges up together, we would get the corner of the box or the corner of the cube. Then if we take 308 degree angles and add them together, we get 324 degrees and that leaves us with a gap of 360 degrees minus 324 or 36 degrees right there. And then folding these together and, and gluing those edges together, we would get that portion of the dodecahedron. So that was three polygons coming together at a particular point. Look, let's look at, at um, where more than three come together. Here's, the, here's a part of the, of the octahedron. Now here there are four equilateral triangles coming together. And here's a piece of the icosahedron where five equilateral triangles are coming together. For the octahedron, that would be four times 60 or 240. Subtract that from 360 and that gives us this gap right here of 120 degrees and then we would glue those, those, um, those edges together. For the icosahedron, we have five times 60, which is 300, leaving us with a gap of only 60 degrees right there. And then those two edges would come together. But let's take a, a closer look at that, that icosahedron as an example of how that would be folded up into, th into a three-dimensional object. So here is that same picture, but now I've color-coded a little bit to show where those, um, where those faces are. And you see here that we've, I've drawn the edges that are going to come together in red. So when we put those together, we get a picture that looks like this. It almost looks like a pentagon, but notice that the the center of it is going into the into the page. Okay, so that is a that is how we have a a flat plane or object seen on the left becoming a three-dimensional object seen on the right. 
So the final polygon that we could use is the is the hexagon, the regular hexagon. And each of the interior angles is 120 uh, degrees. So we have th those three coming to a point, giving us 120 plus 120 plus 120, or 360. But if we subtract that from 360, we're left with nothing, a zero degree. And so there's no gap. In other words, no way for us to fold this up into a three-dimensional object. So for this reason, a regular hexagon cannot be used to create a regular polyhedron. And the extension of this is that it, it can be reasoned further that regular polygons with greater than six sides cannot be used to create regular polyhedra. So a seven or eight sided polygon could not be fo folded up into that, um, into, a, into a regular or any kind of uh, um, polyhedra. So what can we infer from all of this? In order to create a regular polyhedron, first, the only regular uh, polygons that may be used are equilateral triangles, squares, and regular, pol uh, regular pentagons. The hexagons were eliminated because they can't come together and leave us a gap. Second, for equilateral triangles, a polyhedron vertex can only be formed by three, four, or five triangles. If we tried to use six, then that would be six times 60 <clears throat> or 360 degrees. And 360 degrees would not leave us any gap. Third, for squares, a polyhedron vertex can only be formed by three squares. And for regular pentagons, the polyhedron vertex can only be formed by three pentagons. That's the dodecahedron case. This gives us a total of five possibilities for regular polyhedra. Three from the, from the three, three polygons on a vertex, or three equilateral triangles on a vertex, one from the squares, and one from the pentagons for a total of five. So let's restate this now and give, give specific examples. The first one is that vertices created by three equilateral triangles using a total of four triangles would give us the tetrahedron. Vertices created by four equilateral triangles using a total of eight triangles would give us the octahedron. Vertices created by five equilateral triangles using a total of 20 triangles gives us the icosahedron. Vertices created by three squares using a total of six squares gives us the hexahedron or more popularly the cube. And finally, vertices created by using three regular pentagons using a total of 12 of those pentagons gives us the dodecahedron. Therefore, this group of polyhedra, often called the platonic solids, are the only, and I emphasize the only, regular polyhedra. And for the reasons given in this presentation, there cannot be any other than five of these. The purpose of this presentation has been to explain why there are only five of these platonic solids or regular polyhedra. The story goes much further, however. Um, the history of the platonic solids is rich and deserves further study, and I encourage you to, to look into that on the internet or in, in publications. One that I'll mention 
it was famously given by the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler and is known as the Mysterium Cosmographicum or the Cosmographic Mystery. How's that for a name? What Kepler showed with this is he took the platonic solids and used them to to show the orbital diameters of the first five planets of the solar system. And here's a picture of Kepler's model from six. So you can see that what he did was he he put platonic solids within platonic solids within platonic solids and was able to to map out the orbits of of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and also Saturn, um, which I, I said there were only five. There are actually six there. So this is a very interesting uh, application of the platonic solids. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching this presentation, and uh, I hope this uh, enlightens your understanding of solid geometry.